This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Okay guys, the time's finally here. It's finally here. Do you know what time it is? I'm gonna act like you don't anyway. It's time for the reread. I hate the way I just said that. I asked you guys today on my bookstagram, I asked you guys, hey, so we know that I'm doing an Akshar reread. Do you guys want this in one big video or do you guys want me to separate them? That way you have like a video for each book because this is going to be a 110% full comprehensive spoiler video. Like I'm going all in. We're going to be talking about literally like every single plot line, everything to do with these books. I'm going to be like post-it noting them. I'm going to be writing notes in them. I'm going to be annotating, tabbing the whole entire nine yards so i asked you guys should i split this up because if not i don't know how long this video is because i have not read all these books yet i was like what if this video is like four or five hours long i kid you not i could foresee it being that much i have that many thoughts you guys said you wanted one big video so here we are i'm actually starting this like in the middle of may well it's kind of still like early midst may and of course we're going in order i wish i didn't have to because i want to start with that but we do have to not suffer through because i love the last like I would say like 40% of this book. I love it so much. Just like the first 60% is a little bit painful. It's kind of honestly disappointing how much I can't get this book out. I am going to be rereading and annotating with my card covers because I said this in like a video, but I can't remember what video it's in, but I have like lightly annotated all of my Akatar books previously and I just don't like annotating over previous annotations. So I got the hardbacks too completely and utterly reread these but also the weird thing is is inside of these it says from the library of annie walters and i got this on amazon so it's a little odd also if you hear a sound people are outside mowing the lawn what shall we annotate with obviously akatar is red do i have red tabs okay i literally have no tabs that would go with this book in the way that i want it to why does this have red dye on it but when did this happen it's looking like we're gonna have to use these i don't know i don't usually highlight a lot but if i do highlight i would like it to be a very light highlighter so i think i'm gonna go with this one. Oh my god the fact that this this hits so much harder now it says for josh because you would go under the mountain for me I love you. <sighs> I'm gonna die. Okay, so this is what our annotations are looking like. So this like orangish color is like lovey, sweet moments. Then we have quotes, my achy bricky heart for like all the sad moments. We have this pink one is all of the important things that we're gonna have to tab along the way. And then the purple are like my absolute favorite moments from the book. I like to have those tab that way I can like go back to them. I think I'm gonna start reading outside. There's that, I can't believe we're starting my Akchar reread. You know, you know what time it is. Hello everybody. Before we get into today's video, you guys know what we're gonna do. We're gonna thank the sponsor of today's video, which is none other than Squarespace. Thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Don't even act like you guys don't know what's up, okay? I always talk about Squarespace. I literally love them. I tell you guys so many times that if you guys are looking for whether you're going to be an online retailer, a blog, you're running your own little business, whatever it is, you guys need to be using Squarespace, okay? Squarespace has so many different things for all of you guys, and it's so simple and easy to use. You literally just boom, 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 go on Squarespace, start your free trial. There are so many templates as soon as you get onto the website. There's literally so many to choose from, and boom, all you have to do is click on it. You can customize it any way you want. You can just follow that same little structure. You can change the colors. You can add whatever you want. You can literally change whatever you want. Change up the whole design if you want, okay? You can do world is your oyster, okay? You can do whatever you want. Also, for those of you who are running either whether it's a blog, business, you're running stores, whatever it may be, there are so many different data and analytics that can help you in the success of your business, okay? So if you are running your own business and you need to be scheduling things, there are scheduling things on there where people can go on your website and you can see where the schedule is at. If you are somebody who is 
running a blog or just like a business, you can see where the traffic in your website is coming from, where the people are coming from. You can see who's visiting your website, how they're getting there, all of these different things. Okay, there's so many different forms of data that you guys can use. And then also, if you guys are running a blog, they have so many different features for that that help with the blogging tool. That's more of like what I try to go for. My favorite thing is how they highlight the different social aspects and there are blogging tools where you can create a community within your own little blog but people can go and share your social medias and they can visit your social medias simple and easy as clicking a button that's exactly right so i know you guys are going to want to start a free trial on squarespace so all you guys have to do is go to squarespace.com to start your free trial but then when you guys are ready to launch you guys can head to squarespace.com slash jesse sidwell to get 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain as always thank you so much to squarespace for sponsoring today's video i love ya make me do too much labor you guys know that tiktok audio where it's like where's rick don't care where's rick you know like you guys know that is literally how i feel when trying to reread this book <sighs> i'm slowly but surely reading this because i don't love the first part of this book i just read the part where she kills the wolf in the woods and why is it so sad because she's like scared that it's a fairy and she kills the wolf anyway because it's about to take the deer and obviously like her whole entire family is starving and Feyre is the only person that is like supplying for her family and so she's like i have to get this deer like i can't let this wolf take this deer away from me and she like is scared that it's a fairy but then she's like no it can't be a fairy and it says his legs were twitching as a low whine sliced through the wind impossible he should be dead not dying he pawed at the ground his breathing already slowing was he in much pain or was his whimper just his attempt to shove death away i wasn't sure i wanted to know and then at the end of the chapter it says I wish I had it in me to feel remorse for the dead thing, but it was the forest and it was winter. And like, I never before, like when thinking back on this, I never like felt bad. When you think about it, Feyre is literally just like surviving off of her survival instincts. So like, of course, that's like what she's going to do to try to like feed her family. It's so sad also to think about, I think it's like towards the middle of the book when one of the fairies come in and she like watches him die after he got his rip wings ripped out. Does she think back on this during that time? I can't remember. It's so sad. Okay. Okay guys. So it's been a little bit. I actually have not been currently like reading, but I was about to get back into Akatar and I have a few thoughts because I'm still in chapter two, but I was reading it pretty slow earlier because I was really tired. So I was reading it slow. First of all, when my things is like chapter two is where you meet like nesta and elaine and their dad and it's so hard like not to hate nesta after i read a course of flames it made me really love nesta and like her character development and it's just so hard not to go right back to hating her and go through the whole entire character process again after rereading this book just because genuinely and i am somebody that i'm not a nesta hater before anyone says anything because I, like i just said i have learned to love nesta through her book it's just so hard like nesta is genuinely a terrible person in these books i know that you learn about stuff in her book but like just this behavior is really inexcusable to me the fact that Feyre is really like out risking her life going to these super dangerous woods to feed her family and she comes home and nesta is always making comments about how filthy she is and Nessa doesn't even do the bare minimum that Feyre asks of her. Right here on page 15 I put a sticky note because this is some foreshadowing. Our first little foreshadowing. Well I'm sure it's not the first but the thing about Sarah J Mass, because obviously you guys are watching this video. You guys have read Sarah J Mass's books. Maybe just Akatar. Maybe all of them. Maybe just Throne of Glass. Maybe just Akatar. I don't know. She is very... Oh, I have the word. Do you guys ever have the word in your brain and then lose it? Like you're about to say it and then it goes <sighs> into like the abyss she's very thoughtful about every single thing that she puts in and what i mean by that is that everything has a purpose she's very purposeful that's the word i was looking for with what she writes and so on page 15 she talks about how she painted the dresser and it says frowning at the violets and roses i painted around the knobs of elaine's drawer the crackling flames i painted around nesta's and the night sky whirls of yellow stars standing in for white around mine Okay, foreshadowing. The thing is, is that we don't really know much about Elaine yet. Um, not just in these books, but like 
in the whole entire Axar series, she hasn't really been explored. Um, we know that she's like a seer, but we don't know like what the whole entire, like obviously the flowers and Elaine being very like into nature and stuff is going to play a huge role into her future but the crackling flames she painted for nesta and when you know we'll talk more about the book and i'll reference it when we get to a court of silver flames there they called a court of silver flames hello and then the night sky worlds of yellow stars standing in for white around mine it's so purposeful and i literally yeah i just read this foreshadowing to their future stay around the night sky nesta flames and then i put question marks for Elaine because I do not know. Elaine and Nesta are talking about Thomas, um, the guy that like was wanting to marry Nesta. Yeah, because she says that Nesta can't even chop wood for us, but you want to marry a woodcutter's son. Oh, 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 bless it. Okay, sorry guys, uh, Charlie needs her kettle time. Okay guys, it is quite literally, I think like a month later since like the other clips were filmed because I, where did I just put my book at? I have not been in the mood to, not that I haven't been in the mood to reread Ektar because I've really been wanting to reread it, but it's just that I haven't been in the mood to like sit down and talk to the camera, but also because I like reading the beginning portion of this book is a little rough, not because it's bad, but just because like, after you know what you have to look forward to this story not the storyline but like the first like 60 percent of this book really doesn't compare <laughs> at all because obviously since this is a spo full spoiler like i am excited to read about under the mountain again like i really want to reread that and then obviously i really want to reread akamov i have been trying to make some progression into this book it's not a whole lot is really happening. I wrote down a few notes in my little handy baby journal of what's happened. We had Feyre and Lucian kind of start to sprout their friendship because she basically goes and goes like does border patrol with him. She thought that she was going to convince him to convince Tamlin to let her go but then you know Lucian's like girl I don't like you like it would take no convincing. I know exactly what you're doing. There's no way out of this treaty but I actually can't remember if there was a way out of the treaty but they were just specifically doing this so they could sit. no there wasn't a way out of the treaty but also they were doing it because they wanted to see if Feyre could potentially be the one to like free them. I don't know. I feel like I vaguely remember that. Maybe wrong. We'll see later. Also in that scene, we get him talking about her. He just says her. She's asking about the mask and why they all like have this curse where basically they're wearing the masks. You guys know like when she goes into the spring court, like Tamlin's always wearing a mask. Lucian's always wearing a mask. Okay, everyone's wearing like a masquerade ball mask that covers most of their face. Is this like a fashion choice here? Like she's kind of like judging them. And she's just asking because she obviously found out earlier that like this is like a, uh, she doesn't know it's a curse or does she know it's a curse? literally actively rereading it why am i not like stowing away knowledge she's basically like why is this a thing and he's like something sent from the depths of hell which he's talking about amaratha and or amaratha i don't know how you say her name it's not important so i will mispronounce it because i hate her he is talking about her and then he's like oh wait like i don't know if she can hear like her and she's like she doesn't ask him who her is because she just assumes that it's a high lord and she just kind of assumes that she's one of the seven high lords or whatever we get that and then also we're just kind of getting more of trying to build the connection between Feyre and Tamlin he sees her dad out in the garden and she goes to like go after him but then Tamlin stops her and he's like where are you going and she's like my dad and he's like that's not your dad I thought you were warned about this stuff like why are you being so stupid Feyre and we're kind of as the reader like Feyre he kind of has a point why are you being dumb like you think you're dear old dad was like making it through but also there's a little bit of foreshadowing let me see if i can find it it's in chapter 11 and she says my father my father had come to take me to save me whatever benefits tamlin had given him upon my departure couldn't be too tempting then maybe he had a ship prepared to take us far far away and i know like her dad was like into all of i forget what her dad did like before they were you know everything got taken away but i almost also felt like it was foreshadowing to what happens in aka war Maybe it's not. Maybe I'm literally just like reaching. Yeah, we just have like scenes of her and Tamlin. So not a lot has been going on. It's really just trying to build connections with like Lucian and Tamlin and starting to kind of like get little puzzle pieces of things. I just wanted to update you guys because I do want to finish this tonight. 
8 30 p.m right now and i would really like to start akamoff later obviously i'm not gonna finish both of these books tonight but i would really like to start akamoff i actually already have an update because upon a reread especially when it's a fantasy of the sort because obviously when you're first reading the book the like under the mountain thing is like such a big like kind of plot twist that you find in the book like did not see that coming at all and it's so funny like when i reread to think like i just full on was not suspecting a single thing in reading this scene where Feyre wakes up and she kind of stumbles upon tamlin and lucian having an argument where lucian is basically ripping into tamlin because he's like we are running out of time like look at all of the stuff that's coming into our woods we you're letting this slip like you're not even trying like you're not even trying with Feyre. and then tamlin it's like it was a mistake from the start i can't stomach it not after what my father did to their kind to their lands i won't follow in his footsteps won't be that sort of person so back off first of all when did all of a sudden tamlin have morals second of all it's like tamlin i can like understand though because here's the thing i'm not a tamlin hater i hate tamlin for Feyre. like i will never go down that road again you know what i mean i'm not one of these people that like don't want tamlin to have a happy ending like so people are like i don't care what happens to tamlin I want Tamlin to end up happy in some sort of way. In a way, he kind of was used as like a plot device to like upend the love triangle type of thing that was going on. And do I like Tamlin? No. But do I hate him? No. In this sense of it all, it's a very, it's a very selfish, very selfish act because instead of thinking of like everybody else that he was supposed to save he's really just thinking of himself and like wanting to give up i don't know if that makes any sense first of all i want to point out Feyre is in like the little study that tamlin takes her to and she's looking at the mural of like what happened to make like the lands split and she's like explaining all that with the cauldron and everything like that which another reason why i wanted to reread these books is because stuff interconnects is all i will say and i kind of wanted to go back and see like if i can pick up on things or like understand better like, what this whole entire like the actual fantasy elements of the world are but it is so funny to see the little hints the little sprinkles of hints because she says the six other courts of prithian occupied a patchwork of territories all Autumn, summer and winter were easy enough to pick out and then she goes and above that perched in frozen mountainous spread of darkness and stars the sprawling massive territory of the night court love how you went into detail about the night court i literally never thought like i just thought maybe it was just like a detail how did i how did i not assume that this would be something important there were things in the shadows between those mountains little eyes gleaming teeth a land of lethal beauty the hairs on my arms rose but where i'm kind of confused is it says in the center of the land as if it were the core around which everything else had spread or perhaps the place where the cauldron's liquid had first touched was a small snowy mountain range from it arose a mammoth solitary peak bald of snow bald of life as if the elements refused to touch it there were no more clues about what it might be nothing to indicate its importance and i suppose that the viewers were already supposed to know this was not a mural for human eyes and where i'm confused is is this supposed to be a nod no, because the night court is Valeris. But is this supposed to be, like, the mountain where she goes under? Or is it supposed to be Valeris? I feel so stupid right now that I don't know. But I am confused. But I just thought that was funny. Like, the little Easter egg of, like, her talking. Oh, yeah, there's a summer, autumn, spring. Yeah, oh. Oh, the night court. And it's like this. And it looks like this. And my hairs on my arms are stained. A few more thoughts that I have. First of all, any interaction between Lucian and Feyre in Akatar is just funny to me. Because Lucian, his personality kind of does a full 180. Once we get to like Akamoth and Akabor. I don't know. His personality goes, so through, goes through so many different things. That I would honestly kind of like to see him maybe get back to this. Where he's like witty and kind of not like carefree. Because obviously... obviously he has a lot of things to like care and worry about i don't know he seemed more free-spirited in actor like a little bit but because he comes in and he had heard a run tamlin arguing and she said that lucian is just who he is like he doesn't have to be somebody else but also she asks him where he's been and he says i had to go sort out some hotheads on the northern border official emissary emissary business and i put brothers question mark because I can't remember where his brothers are, like what, like whatever, but I, I don't know why. I just feel like maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Him saying, I'm glad to hear your human heart has warned me though. At least I'm not on the top of your killing list. It's like, okay. But also I wanted to say this, that rereading this book after reading A Court of Silver Flame, I 
well i already knew why but also it's kind of an eye opener because right here when she her and taylor are kind of arguing and he's like do you think i just sit and think of ways to humiliate you and like whatever and she says illiterate ignorant unremarkable proud cold all spoken from nessa's mouth Ech all echoing in my head with her sneering voice because obviously you are hearing from thera in these books like you were in thera's mind so that's what her perception of nesta is and when you think about it you spend all of the four books which i mean frost and starlight to novella where you spend a lot of time with other characters too but the, okay we'll say the first three books uh, long books in favor's point of view and nesta being cold and nasty towards her and you don't see nesta's point of view of these events or like why she's doing it so obviously you're going to build this just hatred almost towards Nesta because you get attached to a character that you know and love and then somebody who is being very mean and terrible to her like you're not gonna want to be in their point of view and like hear them out when rereading like the Nesta's parts I'm like I I don't go back to hating her when I reread it it's just a tough thing because I almost wish I could have been in her head in these different moments to see her rationalize with herself of why she's behaving that way like how do you see in a court of silver flames where it almost pains her to feel these negative emotions towards people but she almost can't help it okay we are at the part where Feyre just gets this bright idea to try to trap the cereal which the cereal honestly an icon an icon throughout this whole entire book with Feyre especially when she goes to Lucien's room and she's talking to him and then she's basically like how would i go about getting a cereal and they're like speaking in hypothetics with each other which is actually funny and also take a bow and a quiver and maybe a knife just like this one and he like hands her the knife he's like i'd be i'd be prepared to run like hell when i freed it to the nearest running water which they hate crossing she says but you're not insane so you'll be here safe and sound i'll be conveniently hunting on the grounds and with my superior hearing i might be feeling generous enough to listen if someone screams from the western woods and then he talks about like that you basically have to keep your mouth shut about me knowing that you're doing this it's a good thing that while you have superior hearing i possess superior abilities to keep my mouth shut <laughs> they're just alliance is everything you need and this is what i mean like I miss this friendship between them because even when like later on in the books and Lucian's kind of like with Feyre and all of them, they don't have the same friendship and connection that they had in this book and it makes me so sad because I love Lucian. He's genuinely one of my favorite characters and I feel like he keeps on getting done dirty. Anyway, she's about to capture the cereal and is this when the cereal is like stay with the High Lord or is it another time that she's talking and she's like stay with the High Lord and she's like oh she's talking about tamlin i can't remember which one that is i don't think it's the first encounter okay i'm reading the part where she just kidnapped the cereal and we're getting like the description of the cereal and i'm really trying to picture it in my head because obviously this much and i've seen fan art of like the cereal and everything to do with avatar i'm really trying to imagine it because like i've said this so many times i'm very bad at like picturing things in my brain i don't think that this is what it is but it would be fun if it was she's looking at the cereal and it says run human part of me whispered begged run and run and never look back and while i think it is her speaking to herself wouldn't this be funny if it was like rezand because wait no isn't it a thing where like rezand could feel like parts of Feyre before he even like met her and stuff like he had like visions of her and he thought of her under the mountain and like this would be him like seeing stuff that she's doing and him being like run 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 wait am i on to something what if i'm like actually right because i looked up this word that i can't pronounce intrinsically says in an essential or natural way so it's funny that that was used like in a natural way because you know like how they communicate because isn't it a thing that rezan was like seeing her but didn't know that it was real and like when he sees her for the first time he's like oh my god wait this is the girl that i have been like seeing in my dreams and stuff but it's like actually her what if this is like common knowledge and i'm just like okay oh <laughs> no not the watery bowels we do not need bodily function descriptions i do not need to know that pharaoh just basically 
crapped herself. Not me literally crossing it out. I just, why, why, why include this detail? Also, and I know maybe it's just inner thought monologue, but like when her and Rezan are communicating with each other, the little italics, like they do the little italics in the book, like whenever they're like talking to each other in their mind. So the voice inside of her head telling her to run, I don't know. I'm just trying to back up my theory here. Now, also, Feyre doesn't know that Tamlin's a High Lord, and she just asked the Surreal about Tamlin. And she's like, the High Lord? And she's like, he's a High Lord? I'm like, girl, get with the politics. God, Feyre, how old is she in this book? 19? <laughs> Could you imagine being 19 and having to deal with all of this? I would literally, like, just... I just wouldn't. I just simply put wouldn't. This, I knew it. I knew this is where it said it. I knew it. I knew it. Favorite asks about Tamlin and she's like, he's a high lord. And the serial just says, stay with the high lord human. That's all you can do. You will be safe. Do not interfere. Do not go looking for answers after today or you will be devoured by the shadow over Prithian. He will shield you from it. So stay close to him and all will be righted. Now we're learning about the King of High Rooms. A few updates. I think the only thing that's happened, Tamlin saved her from the, what were they called? I forget what they were called. It starts with the end, doesn't it? I don't know, but they he like saved her from them. They come home, they have dinner. Lucien is talking to her, like they're all talking to her fine. And then after dinner, Tamlin comes up to her and gives her like a elongated list of words so that she can like write to her family and he offers to help her. And he's like genuinely offering to help her because he sees how much that she has taken care of her family and that no one has ever taken care of her before. And he genuinely like wants to help her. And she's, you know, very closed off to it. She's like, no, she thinks that he's like making fun of her. And he's like, I'm not making fun of you. I'm being genuine. And she says, I don't want your pity. What about a friend? Like, okay, I don't, obviously I don't ship them. Like when I am reading back on it, there's just an overwhelming sense of fondness because there are a lot of scenes in these books where Tamlin is genuinely very nice and sweet towards Feyre and like you know he does some things later on that you're like okay Tamlin what a waste of space but there are some things that you cannot deny that he does that are very sweet to Feyre especially in the beginning I just also laughed because when she kind of they like settle and they're like kind of you know getting along and she asks if she can have some paint and he's like yeah and she's like i'll paint outside that way i'm not making a mess he's like inside outside on the roof wherever you want like but if you need that you'll need a canvas and i wrote no she'll paint anything trust me she'll paint on anything <sighs> don't even get me started on the cabin no i can't do this i can't i'm on chapter 17 right now <sighs> let's see how emotionally strong I am because this, I'm pretty sure I cried when I read this part for the first time, but this is where in the middle of the night, a, I think, yeah, he's from Summer Court and they find him and his wings are ripped off and he's dying. And it just says, my wings, the fairy choked out, his glossy black eyes wide and staring at nothing. She took my wings. I won't cry. I won't cry. Just keep saying it. Oh, I can't handle this. <laughs> this is genuinely hurting my heart because all that the fairy keep all that he keeps saying is she took my wings. She took them. My heart literally feels like it's being ripped out of my chest. I have never felt more for a character that I have absolutely no connection to in my life. This is the part that always gets me. This is so sad because Feyre is like holding his hand and like um, putting her fingers through his hair and says, it will be all right. The fairy closed his eyes and I tightened my grip on his hand. My wings, the fairy whispered, you will get them back. The fairy struggled to open his eyes. You swear, yes, I breathed. The fairy managed a slight smile and closed his eyes again. <laughs> and then he dies. And here goes 
Tamlin ruining it already. Farah's like, no, I want to go with you to like, we can't just leave him here. And he's like, I know, but you have to go upstairs first. And she's like, no, I can hold my own. He's like, no. Okay, already controlling. Why did I forget this of Lucian's backstory? Because when the fairy's on the table, like dying and Lucian like throws up and he has to leave. I remembered obviously that Amaratha took his eye. Also that Lucian like never cared about being the high lord and he like went around doing stuff that he shouldn't and then he fell in love with the girl and then his father had her killed right in front of him and his brothers held him there to watch. I always forget that that happened to him. When you think about that and think about everything else that happens to him later on in the books, it's like, can Lucian, can poor Lucian please, please catch a break? I mean, this man literally is a gutted, gutted in every sense of anything that can happen. Can he be happy? <sighs> okay guys, we've moved the party over to the bed because fireworks are going off outside so charlie's having her little moment so we have white noise on the tv that i keep having to pause so we can talk about this but i've really just been reading and nothing like huge has been happening other than we learned about lucian's like backstory and they went to the little like garden pool thing and like her and tamlin have been growing closer and that's really all that's been happening is like building that relationship you know and like feeling the little sparks of chemistry between them but now Tamlin's telling Feyre his sob story. <laughs> and I'm sorry that I literally annotated and I said, ick, ick alert, ick alert. Because literally, I found out at an early age that fighting and killing were the only things I was good at. I doubt that, I said. He gave me a wry smile. Oh, I can play a mean fiddle. What? What? No. Not the fiddle. The watery bells and the fiddle, please. I forgot this because he's talking about his mom because she's in the garden. He was like, this was the mate present for my dad to my mom. Fortunately or unfortunately, they were all killed by the high lord of an enemy court. I was spared for whatever reason or cauldron granted luck. My mother, I mourned. The others, my brothers and I have tried to save me from a fate like yours. You're such a liar, Tamlin. The fact that he should have like lies to Feyre over like what happened with Rizand and his family and his father. The fact that him and Rizand were friends. And that he betrayed Rizand and they, they killed his mom and sister. And he wants to act like Rizand's the enemy. Which we haven't gotten into all that yet because he just had an enemy court. But then I'm pretty sure after she meets Rizand, like after Rizand is in the, like, in the, when he comes in the house at one point. And he's like, he's evil and he's this and he's that. It's like, why are you lying? I, I know why you're lying. Because you felt that. You felt that pull between Feyre and Rizand. You felt it and you're scared. And you're like, don't like him. He's bad, but he's not. I know it's coming. It's the night of the, what's it called? Kal Mai? Kalen Mai? Kalen Mai? I don't know. It's the night of that little ritual though. And Feyre goes and hears a vicious a wild wicked voice weaving in between the drum beats whispered go go see i wonder who that was and she goes out to like see what's going on and the three fairies like corner her and she's like stop it leave me alone leave me alone the ground rolled up beneath me and i reached for my knives but sturdy hands grasped me under the shoulders before i could draw them or hit the grass they were strong hands, warm and broad, not at all like the prodding, bony fingers of the three fairies who went utterly still as whoever caught me gently set me up, right? There you are. I've been looking for you. I'm going to throw up. There is no way. There is no way. There's no way. I am so down bad. I literally need to get up. You are. I've been looking for you, said a deep, sensual male voice. <laughs> oh my god. I should have known. I should have known. Like, why was she... Like, her describing his voice as sensual? Like, yeah, girl, he's not staying with... She's not staying with Tamlin. What was I thinking? But I kept my eyes on the three fairies, bracing myself for flight as the male behind me stepped to my side and slipped a casual arm around my shoulders. The three lesser fairies paled, their dark eyes wide. Thank you for finding her for me, my savior said to them, smooth and polished. Enjoy the right. There was enough of a bite beneath his last words that the fairies stiffened. Without further comment, they scuttled back to the bonfires. I stepped out of the shelter of my savior's arm and turned to thank him. Standing before me was the most beautiful man I've ever seen. 
I should have known right, right here, right here at this very moment, the most beautiful man I've ever seen. I should have known. I'm literally so down bad. Every. <laughs> Everything about the stranger radiated sensual grace and ease. High fade, no doubt. His short black hair gleamed like raven's feathers, offsetting his pale skin. His pale skin and blue eyes so deep they were violet. Even in the firelight, they twinkled with amusement as he beheld me. He does not have pale skin. Ah, I love it so much. For a moment, we said nothing. Thank you didn't seem to cover what he'd done for me, but something about the way he stood with absolute stillness, the night seeming to press in closer around him made me hesitate to speak, made me want to run in the other direction. Not me, not me. <laughs> his clothes, all black, all finely made, were cut close enough to his body. I could see how magnificent he was, even as if he'd been molded from the night itself. Girl, <laughs> no. Had I just traded three monsters for something far worse? Girl, you're welcome for saving you. I bristled at his arrogance. Girl, me too, but... <laughs> Strange for a mortal to be friends with two fairies, he mused. Aren't humans usually terrified of us? And aren't you, for that matter, supposed to keep to your side of the wall? It might be a while before they return. May I escort you somewhere in the meantime? Yes. With the right then, try to stay out of trouble. His eyes gleamed in a way that suggested staying out of trouble meant staying far, far away from him. Though it might have been the biggest risk I'd ever taken, I blurted, so you're not part of the spring court? Girl, I know you want, why you wanted to keep talking to him. I know why. I know why. He returned to me, every movement exquisite and laced with lethal power. Girl, she doesn't even describe Tamlin like this. Do I look like I'm part of the spring court? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I'm wearing all black. No, I'm not a part of the noble spring court and glad of it. And then he gestured to his face where the mask might go. <laughs> I should have walked away, should have shut my mouth. Why are you here then? The man's remarkable eyes seemed to glow with enough of a deadly edge that I backed up a step. Girl, be so for real. You know you didn't want to back up. Because all the monsters have been let out of their cages tonight, no matter what court they belong to. So I may roam wherever I wish until the dawn. But it's actually sad when you think about it because that's genuinely like what he was doing because he's never out of Amarotha's grasp. And so he was just trying to enjoy a little bit of freedom. Enjoy the right, I repeated as blandly as I could. <sighs> now I won't see him for like a few more pages and I'm so sad. So, a little bit of an update. It is literally midnight right now and I am on chapter 27. So stuff went down. So I actually haven't been recording because my camera battery was like, on its last leg so i was letting it charge for a little bit but basically we've established the relationship we were building the relationship between tamlin and Feyre. but the weird thing is upon the reread you are getting snippets of them just starting to like like each other and so upon the reread it's like maybe it's because i'm comparing it to her and reese no way that she like <laughs> loved tamlin the way that she says she does i don't know not like Feyre's a liar but like it just doesn't feel like they have that type of connection. I may just be gaslighting myself, I don't know, but I just read the part where Reese shows up at the spring court, obviously, and he basically stirs the pot and then dips. And it was just so hard to read though, because like whenever he says some things to Feyre and like says some things about Feyre, because during this time, I remember it was during this time, he kind of was putting on this front for everybody. Like he was this really, really mean and like evil guy to kind of keep up this front with Am Amarantha. And it's like reading it knowing that this isn't how he really is, is like, it's hard to read, but now we're to the point where Tamlin is like sending Feyre away and telling her like leave and she doesn't know what's going on. He's like, you have to leave, you have to leave. Like I will tell people that I killed Andrus, like you have to leave, Your I will send you back home, your family will stay rich. <laughs> Like, that's not what's important, but I think he was just offering her some security, but it just still is funny to me. 
but he's basically like you you gotta go like you can't stay here which i understand why but upon the reread i noticed so many times like obviously we all talk about what happens in akamoff the big thing that like happens between her and tamlin and akamoff but it's like he had that behavior all throughout this book like all throughout this book he is constantly telling Feyre, don't go here don't go there don't go out of your room don't go this don't go there really should have seen this coming because this is at this point repeated behavior from this man just finished the chapter where tamlin's like you have to go like you he's still not telling Feyre though i think Feyre finds out what's going on from alice doesn't she or elise alice i guarantee you it's not as simple as alice i guarantee you it's elise she finds out whatever and she has to leave and you know what i'm not above admitting when there's a cute moment Okay, and why did it low-key make me sad whenever she was like, so you're making me go away because I'm useless in a fight. And he was like, I'm sending you away because it makes me sick thinking about you in their hands. And I was like, <laughs> okay, that was kind of a slay. She was asking, how long do I have to go away for? A week? A month? A year? I don't know, but not forever, right? And he goes, not forever. Who wants someone around who's so covered in thorns? Thorns? thorny prickly sour contrary not forever and then whenever they're you know what and i said this i said okay that's kind of slight says i love you he whispered and kissed my brow thorns and all i don't care what y'all say that kind of did slay a little frustrating to think about because she's like going away in the carriage tamlin had said i love you thorns and all and then when she was leaving it says tamlin smiled at me one last time i love you he said and stepped away I should say it. I should say those words, but they got stuck in my throat because of what he had to face. Because he might not find me again despite his promise. Because beneath it all, he was immortal and I would grow old and die. And maybe he meant it now and perhaps last night had been altering for him as it had been for me. But I would not become a burden to him. I would not become another weight pressing upon his shoulders. So I said nothing as the carriage moved. And I did not look back as we passed through the manor gates and into the forest beyond. And it's frustrating to think if Fagra would have just told him the truth and like i love you they wouldn't have had to go under the mountain they wouldn't have had to do all of the stuff that they had to do pharaoh wouldn't have trauma <laughs> she just would have said the three words that she already meant isn't that a crazy thought i forgot well i didn't forget but i just remembered after that's the same thing as saying i forgot this is one of my favorite parts of this book is when Feyre comes back home and she comes to the door and sees that her family is literally like filthy rich and tamlin found the ships that like put her family into debt like when her dad had the ship he found them brought them back to her dad with all the riches on them and they're like rich and i'm pretty sure he sent Feyre home with like a bunch of money too elaine's all like talking and it's like you know just bubbly being elaine her sweet caring self and then nesta's kind of like just staring at Feyre, and it's just kind of like you know being cold distant not very you know out of the ordinary but still like a little like whatever elaine is talking to Feyre and she's like yeah nesta didn't last like the dating season whatever it's called and she's just been weird and she's like you know she went to go see you and like she it was, she was only gone a week her carriage broke it's just funny to read now their interaction it's genuinely one of my favorite parts of this book she's just Feyre's describing nesta and says she wore a simple pale lavender gown her hair half up and billowing behind her in a sheet of gold brown beautiful empress still as one of the high fae nesta's basically like saying something to her and Feyre's like it's my home isn't it and nesta says no it's not i think your home is somewhere very far away Feyre says aunt ripley's house there is no aunt ripley your beast's little trick didn't work on me apparently an iron will is all it takes to keep a glamour from digging in so i had to watch as father and elaine went from sobbing hysterics into nothing i had to listen to them talk about how lucky it was for you to be taken to some made-up aunt's house how some winter wind had shattered our door and i thought i'd gone mad but every time i did i would look at that painted part of the table then the claw marks for further down and no it wasn't in my head. Nesta still has a long way to go and she still does quite a bit of things to Feyre like after this that it just shows how much genuinely Nesta does deep down care but because of Nesta's trauma and what she holds within herself like she doesn't really allow herself to like get close and then Feyre says Elaine said you went to visit me though you tried. Nesta snorted her face grave and full of that long simmering anger that she could 
never master. He stole you away into the night, claiming some nonsense about the treaty, and then everything went on as if it had never happened. It wasn't right. None of it was right. You went after me, I said. You went after me to Prithian. I got to the wall. I couldn't find a way through. You trekked two days there and two days back through the winter woods. She shrugged, looking at the sliver she'd pried from the table. I hired that mercenary from town to bring me a week after you were taken with the money from your pelt. She was the only one who seemed like she would believe me. You did that for me? Nesta's eyes, my eyes, our mother's eyes met mine. It wasn't right. Hamlin had been wrong when we discussed whether my father would have come after me. He didn't possess the courage, the anger. If anything, he would have hired someone else to do it for him. But Nesta had gone with that mercenary. My hateful, cold sister had been willing to brave Prithian to rescue me. And then she says, what happened to Thomas Mandry? I asked, the word strangled. I realized he wouldn't have gone with me to save you from Prithian. And for her, with that raging, unrelenting heart, it would have been a line in the sand. <sighs> and she says, Thomas never deserved you anyway. My sister didn't smile, but a light shone in her blue-gray eyes. Tell me everything that happened, she said, in order, not a request. So I did, and when I finished my story, Nesta merely stared at me for a long while before asking me to teach her how to paint. It's just like, even though there's going to be like a lot, and I mean a lot more happened between Nesta and Feyre throughout the whole entire series, up until like where we're at now, it just still warms my heart because especially after reading A Court of Silver Flames and then going back and rereading the series, you understand where Nesta's motivations come from because when you first read the series you just think that Nesta is like cold-hearted and she is cold-hearted genuinely like doesn't care for Feyre couldn't care less about Feyre like there's nothing that's kind of between them but when you read Nesta's point of view and see how much that she genuinely does care and love for her family but there's just things deep down in her that stop her from being it oh, it ripped your heart out of your chest I'm telling you okay I just read the part where they're at the ball that Feyre's dad threw in her honor for her like coming back home or whatever and it's so funny by the way to see like how they were living and Bayer was out here going into the woods like to help her family and then like now that they're rich her dad's just like throwing balls and twisting Elaine around <sighs> what happened to Claire's family because her dad's like oh yeah I'm thinking of buying the blood blood or the Bedours the Bedours property and she's like what and they're like yeah they all died in a house fire well they can't find claire's body can't find claire's body that the whole entire family died in a house fire oh my god like that was supposed to be us that was supposed to be my family i gave that name to rezand and he definitely went and made good on his promise to tell amarantha and that should have been us and so she looks at nesta and she says you must listen carefully everything i've told you must remain a secret you do not come looking for me you do not speak my name to anyone what are you talking about Feyre? my father gaped at me from the end of the table elaine glancing between us shifting in her seat but nesta held my gaze unflinching and then her and nesta have a moment she follows like Feyre upstairs and is like the bedours that was meant to be us but you gave them a fake name those wicked fairies who threatened your high lord she tells Feyre like we don't need you don't look back father once told you never come back and I'm telling you it now like don't come back coming from Nesta that like means a lot it says Nesta remained in my room she would not say goodbye she hated farewells as much as I did but I turned to my sister and said there's a better world Nesta there's a better world out there waiting for you to find it and if I ever get the chance if things are ever better safer I will find you again but Nesta squared her shoulders don't bother. I don't think I'd be particularly fond of fairies. Try to send word once it's safe, and if it ever is, Father and Elaine can have this place. I think I'd like to see what else is out there. What a woman might do with a fortune and a good name. No limits, I thought. There were no limits to what Nesta might do. What she might make of herself once she found a place to call her own. I prayed I would be lucky enough someday to see it. First of all, guys, this is where stuff is going to start getting interesting in the story because Feyre just went back to Prithian to find Tamlin, just to find everything empty. And she finds Alice or Elise, whatever. And she's basically like, girl, he's gone. Like, this is what happened. And I used to never, ever understand. Like, I understood, like, the bare minimum of it. Um, of the whole entire, like, Amarantha, Amarantha situation. Like, but I didn't really understand the full scope of it. I kind of understood all of some of it. I literally just went through the pages and wrote down in all of these sticky notes the whole entire story. So if you guys are still a little bit confused about the Amarantha thing and like what that even is, 
I'll tell you. So basically, Amarantha is a high queen emissary for King Highburn. She charmed the high lords and she basically, and she was a lethal warrior for him that fought in the war. And she had a sister who fought with her, but Silithia fell in love with Jurian, but he was just using her because he was fighting with the humans in the war against the Fae. And he was just using her. Amarantha knew this, but couldn't kill him because how much Silithia loved him. But Jurian ended up betraying her, Silithia, tortured her and butchered her and left her for Amarantha to find, Amarantha to find. And now she hates humans. So after the two sides made the treaty, she killed all of her slaves instead of freeing them. And basically she charmed all of the high lords and was used as the king's emissary to kind of just like get all of the peacekeeping. And she on purpose tricked all of them, manipulated everyone, brought over the king's goods on ships because she won and then she went Prithian to herself so she waited until the high lords threw a ball in her honor and she put a potion from Hybern's book in the wine and she basically stole the high lords powers but like they still have powers but it's like a lot less than what they had and so she then took control of Prithian fairly easily after this and took them as slaves for like years and basically Amarantha wanted Tamlin she wanted to be with him but he didn't want to be with her so one day he sent Lucian to kind of be obviously he's Tamlin's emissary so he was kind of trying to keep the peace and Amarantha was basically like I want to be with Tamlin and Tamlin told her to crawl back into the crap hole that she came out of and then she took his eye so then as an apology she throws this masquerade in Tamlin's honor and people are to wear the little masks to honor his shape-shifting abilities and then publicly at the party she says that the peace will be had if Tamlin joins her as a lover and consort but he refused and he quite literally said he would sooner bed a human than ever be with her. So then she took that personally. And she told Tamlin that he had seven times seven years to find a human girl to marry him. But not any girl. A girl who had ice in her heart. Who hates fairies enough to kill one just as Jurian killed Slithia. So the whole entire treaty was basically a lie. And Andrus was a sacrifice. Why could I not remember the word sacrifice? Andrus was a sacrifice. And basically he was kind of doing a last resort to see. Because for 49 years Tamlin had been doing this when the curse first happened every single day he was sending like people out to see like if somebody would you know want to kill this so that he could get someone to fall in love with him but the girl had to say i love you and look beyond the mask and all the stuff to break the curse and so that's what i was saying earlier like when tamlin says i love you all Feyre had to do was say i love you for the curse to be broke but now, instead, she's going to go under the mountain and go through trials to get to the same end product. I mean, that is how she ultimately gets her powers and turns into a fae. So, I mean, you win some, you lose some. Take me to her. I insisted. As you wish. Chapter 33. Things are starting to get interesting. Well, the book has been interesting. But I'm saying, like, this is really where the book... I remember, though, like... The thing is, is when I read the plot twist, because this kind of was a plot twist, because like obviously, as I said, rereading it, I'm like, how did I not get this? But then again, I knew absolutely nothing about Akatar when I went into it, like nothing. Didn't even know what it was about. When I read that part of it being like, no, there was no treaty, that was a lie, and Marantha cursed everybody, like this is what's going on. My jaw was on the floor from the, that point on to the very end of this book. Like everything that I'm about to read, like my jaw, my jaw, my jaw was literally glued to the floor. This is genuinely one of the most disturbing parts of the book when she's like, goes down into the, I imagine it is kind of like a cave and she's talking to Amarantha and Amarantha's like, what are you here for? And she's like, I'm here to claim the one I love. And then she looks up at the wall and sees Claire's mangled corpse nailed to the wall. And then Amarantha starts talking about everything that she did to Claire. And Faye Red's literally just like, oh my god. I'm going to be so honest with you guys because we just got the riddle, the page where we get the riddle. And whenever I see people that are like, I knew what the answer was right away. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I didn't even think about the riddle. For some reason, I wasn't under the impression that the riddle was going to serve a greater purpose within the story. Don't know why I thought that. Like literally, I remember reading and I remember reading the riddle, but kind of just like my mind skipped over it because we had Lucian literally getting whatever. 
and then all of the stuff was happening that I just kind of like skipped over it. And then when it comes up at the end, I was like, oh, that actually meant something. <laughs> Like, I didn't even think about an answer for the riddle. And I feel like some of y'all are lying. Some of y'all are like, it was so easy. Like, the answer to the riddle. <laughs> Just read the part of the book where Rezand and Feyre strike up their deal. Because when she goes through the first trial and Amarantha is like, only one person bet on you. So, most of my court lost a lot of money. And it was, of course, Reese and Feyre is like rotting literally rotting away in her cell like her arms broken she's bleeding out lucian can't come to help her because he got punished because they found out that he had helped her rezand is like i'll help you but you have to spend two weeks with me every month and then she's like no spits in his face she's like no get away from me i don't care i don't want to spend two weeks with you and he's like okay whatever he goes to leave and she's like wait a week and he's like a week it is and then they do the little deal and then she has the tattoo on her arm because of the deal i think i'll wait to tell him until the moment's right though rezian said the gleam in his eyes told me enough rezian hadn't done any of this to save me but rather to hurt tamlin and i'd fallen into his trap fallen into it worse than the worm had fallen into mine rest up Feyre, rezian said he turned into nothing more than a living shadow and vanished through a crack in the door but he did, Feyre. He did do it for you. He did do it for you. I can remember that this is where things started to shift with me, okay? Because this is like after they make the deal, she has to do her little chores, which made no sense to me. Like why she had to do chores. But anyway, she is talking to Rezan because the guards like have her clean Rezan's room because like people are scared of him. So they think that. Her going in there will make Rezan like go crazy, but they don't know that they struck up a deal and like Rezan likes her. <laughs> and he goes into the room, and first of all, it's as wonderful as it is to see you, Feyre, darling. Do I want to know why you're digging through my fire? Ah! Anyway, they're talking, and she asking about like all the stuff, and then. She says, she let you out for fire night and you somehow got out to put that head in the garden. She asked me to put that head in the garden and asked for the fire night. He looked me up and down. I had my reasons to be out then. Do not think, Feyre, that it did not cost me. He smiled again and it didn't meet his eyes. Are you going to... And when you know why, him saying, do not think, Feyre, that it did not cost me. Why do I want to actually ball my eyes out? Anyway, and then he shows her, like, she's like, can all High Lords, like, shift or whatever? And he shows her, like, his wing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he goes, no attempts at flattery. You have a high enough opinion of yourself already. I doubt the flattery of a little human matters much to you. He let out a low laugh that slid along my bones, warming my blood. <laughs> Oh man, this is like when you start to feel like chemistry between them like for real because they have time like alone with each other And I just remember that this was like the point where I was like Oh wait, like, why is he kind of? <laughs> okay, so you guys are wondering it's two o'clock in the morning. I Literally never stay up this late Please I am so down bad. It is kind of embarrassing. It's like this part where they have to go to like a little party and she basically like gets out of her cell because Reezy and like uses his powers to like get her out of the cell and like do her up where she has like paint all over her body and she's wearing her dress and stuff like you guys know I don't know this part of the book was always weird to me a little bit I was always like didn't really love it but this part where she's like doesn't know who's like doing her up like this like she thinks maybe it's something that amarantha's trying to do to me like i don't know but i can't say anything reason was leaning against the wall our bargain hasn't started yet ah but i need an escort for the party and i thought i'd be squatting in that cell all night alone and then he goes you look just as i hoped you would is this necessary i said gesturing to the paint and the clothing of course he said coolly how else would i know if anyone touches you Why am I going feral? The dress itself won't mar it and neither will your movements, he said. His face close to mine. His teeth were far too near to my throat. <laughs> oh, 
cannot remember precisely where my, it's in italics, my hands have been. But if anyone else touches you, let's say a certain high lord who enjoys springtime. Mm. And Feyre, he added, his voice a caressing murmur. I don't like my belongings tampered with. Sent. He owned me for a week every month. Apparently, he thought that extended for the rest of my life, too. Girl, only if you knew. I think that Reese just really enjoys, like, self-inflicting pain on himself because the knowledge of, like, what Reese and Faye... And Faye. That's her nickname that I guess I gave her all of a sudden. What I know that Reese and Faye were at turn out to be and what they are right now is a little painful but anyway they are talking like one night and he's like kind of just like going back and forth with her he's like your second trials tomorrow like they're talking and then he says like maybe if Tamlin learned how to be a little bit more wicked or what did he use about cruelty then he would know what it means to be true high lord and it would have kept the spring court from falling and she said, and Feyre said, your court fell too. Sadness flickered in those violet eyes. I wouldn't have noticed it had I not felt it deep inside me. You don't know why, but I know why. What I do or have done for my court is none of your concern. Feyre, babe, you don't even know what he's doing for his court. Everything that he has been through in the past 50 years has been for his court. You do not even know, babe. Respectfully, I know you don't know, so I'm not holding it against you, babe. But that just pained me what you just did to him and then also he says i knew i was on dangerous ground but i didn't care what do you want with me beyond taunting tamlin taunting tamlin is my greatest pleasure he said with a mock bow and as for your question why does any male need a reason to enjoy the presence of a female you saved my life and through your life i saved tamlin's why he winked smoothing his blue black hair that Feyre is the real question isn't it i could just picture Reese being like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? This hurts so bad. This hurts so bad. This hurts so bad. Like, it's <laughs> just me. Like, um, this isn't funny at all, but reading, reading the second trial scene, all I'm thinking about are the Akatar memes that I saw when it was like Lucian when he realized that he's about to lose his life because Feyre can't read. It's not funny, but that's all I'm thinking about is when he's like, Oh my god, I'm about to die. Like when he realizes that Feyre can't read and that's the whole entire point. In the beginning, he's like, Feyre, just answer it. What are we doing, babe? Why are you not answering it? And then he realizes, oh my god, she can't read. And just seeing the memes now it's stuck in my head and I'm laughing even though it's not funny. Oh my gosh, when she goes to pick the second option and says, I wretch for the second lever, but a binding pain racked my hand before I could touch the stone. I hissed, withdrawing. I opened my palm to reveal the slitted eye tattoo there. It narrowed. I had to be hallucinating. When I reached for the third lever, no pain. Rezian's face remained a mask of boredom. Sweat slipped down my brow, stinging my eyes. I can only trust him. I can only give myself up again, forced to conceive by my helplessness. The spikes were so enormous up close. All I had to do was lift my arm above my head and I'd burn the flesh off my hands. Feyre, please, Lucian. I had won. Ah! Rezan coming through, as he usually does. Reading after she wins and she feels like so defeated and so scared that she just wants to cry. But then she starts to hear Rezan's voice and he says, don't let her see you cry. Put your hands at your sides and stand up. Stand. Don't give her the satisfaction of seeing you break. Stare her down. No tears. Wait until you're back in your cell. Count to ten. Don't look at Tamlin. Just, st just stare at her. Now walk away. Turn on your heel. Good, walk towards the door, keep your chin high, let the crowd part one step after another. I forgot that she does stab Tamlin in the last trial because she figures out that like all the times that she thought that she was eavesdropping, it was really because Tamlin left all of the doors open because he wanted her to hear him and Lucian's conversations and how he has a heart of stone. It's not a real human beating heart, so she knows that she can stab him. Is it bad that like, and it's just because it's the Ray Ray, she, like the knife comes out like bent at the end because he has like a stone heart. And more than Tamlin being saved, I am more happy about the line that says, Rezand at the foot of the day, grin from ear to ear. That part literally makes me happier than Tamlin being alive. Wow, this like escalated quickly. 
when Amarantha starts like basically killing Feyre because she's mad that like she out whatevered her. Literally says, Feyre, someone roared. No, not someone, Rizand. I was a goner at this point, by the way. Like when I was first reading this book, I was literally like, oh, I'm a goner. Like, <laughs> this is like so intense. You think you're worthy of him, a high lord? You think you deserve anything at all, human? My back arched and my ribs cracked one by one. Rizan yelled my name again, yelled it as though he cared. Cause he does, cause he does. Feyre. Meanwhile, Feyre's literally just getting absolutely throttled. Like she's just getting beat the crap out of. Guys, like I already know it's gonna happen, but I'm still on the edge of my seat. Reason was on his feet, my bloody knife in his hands. He launched himself at Amarantha, swift as a shadow, the ash dagger aimed for her throat. She lifted a hand, not even bothering to look, and he was blasted back by a wall of white light. Oh, stop. I breathed, blood filling my mouth as I strained a hand to reach her feet. Please. Reese's arms buckled as he fought to rise, and blood dripped from his nose, splattering on the marble. His eyes met mine. The bond between us went taut. I flashed between my body and his, seeing myself through his eyes bleeding and broken and sobbing. This is when, like, I was so confused because, like, right here, I was like, why are we switching to, like, Team Reason? Like, not even just me, but, like, I feel like she was more concerned in this moment about Reese than she was about Tamlin. Like, she's like, Reese, no, 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 please stop, please stop. Like, she was begging Amarantha to stop hurting him. Also, like, where is Tamlin? Wasn't the whole other thing that Reese thought that Tamlin was going to kill Amarantha, like, as soon as... Oh, wait, is the curse still a thing? Rizan bellowed my name as I lost my grip on the room. Then the memories began, a compilation of the worst moments of my life, a storybook of despair and darkness. The final page came and I wept, not entirely feeling the agony in my body as I saw the young rabbit bleeding out in the forest, clearing my knife through her throat, my first kill, the first life I'd taken. I'm gonna pretend that this quote says Rizand, cause she says, say you don't love him. And the quote is, but I wouldn't say it because loving Tamlin was the only thing I had left, the only thing I couldn't sacrifice. And I'm just going to act like it says Rizand. Love, I breathe, the answer to the riddle is love. Tamlin's eyes went wide before something forever cracked in my spine. Oh yeah, because she solves the riddle she dies and then as soon as all that happens all hell breaks loose because all of the curse is lifted and Tamlin immediately kills her I think yeah he like completely murders her like he like full-on murders her I'm literally eating this up I'm not even thinking about sleep the absolute like if anything Amarantha has is literally the audacity to back away from Vera's corpse and she said please like begged Tamlin like not to kill her. Literally the best thing that Tamlin has ever done. That I realized whose eyes I had been seeing through. The reason didn't come any closer to my corpse. No, someone breathed Lucian. <laughs> I loved, like as soon as Feyre went under the mountain, Lucian and Feyre's like friendship did a full 180 where like you could tell how much he cared about her like when he visits her in the cell and he's like why would you make a deal with Rizan like you knew I was gonna come for you at some point she's like I was literally on the ground dying like I didn't know when you were coming and he was like girl I literally received 20 lashings because I helped you before like I just now could get up and walk my bad and Rizan says, Rizan stepped forward, bringing my shred of soul with him, and I found Tamlin staring at me, at us. For what she gave, Rizan said, extending a hand. Predecessors have granted a few before. This makes us even, he added, and I felt a twinkle of his humor as he opened his hand and let the seed of light fall on me. Oh, girl, uh, the fact that Tamlin is, like, holding you in his arms and you're talking, like, you're describing Rizan's humor. I don't blame you, girl. I've become high fetty. Ah, period. Oh God, this is the part. <sighs> it's like after the mountain and she goes by very fast. I mean like, yeah, so we had to do like meetings and all this blah, 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 blah. But you kind of do get this little snippet of like how deeply Feyre is like struggling, but no one really sees it. And Tamlin's just kind of like, okay, business as usual. Like she didn't have to kill to high fae and like everything that she's been through and he says i was pulled from sleep by something tugging at my middle a thread deep inside i knew who summoned me long before i opened the door to the hall and patted down it oh same girl i found myself on a small balcony jutting out of the side of the mountain crazy and chuckled softly for where i could vaguely make him out standing along the stone rail i forgot it's been a while for you i looked at him finally 
no, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Stop. I looked at him finally. His wings were out tucked behind him, but his hands and feet were normal. No talons in sight. What do you want? It didn't come out with the snap I'd intended. Not as I remembered how he'd fought again and again to attack Amarantha to save me. Just to say goodbye. A warm breeze ruffled his hair, brushing tendrils of darkness off his shoulders before your beloved whisks you away forever. Not forever, I said, wiggling my tattoo fingers for him to see. Don't you get a week every month? How could I forget? He knew what I meant and shrugged. <laughs> because when the legends get written, I didn't want to be remembered for standing on the sidelines. I want my future offspring to know I was there and then I fought against her at the end even if I couldn't do anything useful. <laughs> okay, me when I lie, just say it's because you're literally obsessed with Feyre and in love with her. Because he went on, his eyes blocked with mine. I didn't want you to fight alone or die alone. Stop! Thank you, I said my throat tight. Reese flashed a grin that didn't quite reach his eyes. I doubt you'll be saying that when I take you to the night court. Ah. Are you going to fly home? Unfortunately, it would take longer than I can afford. Another day, I'll taste the skies again. You never told me you loved the wings or the flying. Shrugged, everything I love has always had a tendency to be taken from me. I tell very few about the wings or the flying. Stop, stop. S see, this is what I mean. Earlier, I was like, Re I was like, Reese isn't pale because he goes, some color had already come into that moon white face and I wondered whether he might have once been tanned before Amarotha had kept him below ground for so long. A high lord who loved to fly, trapped under a mountain, shadows not of his own making still haunted those violet eyes. See, because I knew that. I was like, Reese is literally not pale. I don't know, but it was because, duh, Destiny, he's under the mountain. Be glad of your human heart, Feyre. Pity those who don't feel anything at all. Well, goodbye for now, he said. Literally, my favorite part of the book is when he's leaving, when he's like, be glad for your human heart, Feyre, pity those who don't feel anything at all. I couldn't explain about the hole that had already formed in my soul, didn't want to, so I just nodded. Well, goodbye for now, he said, rolling his neck as if we hadn't been talking about anything important at all. He bowed at the waist, those wings vanishing entirely, and had begun to fade into the nearest shadow when he went rigid. His eyes locked on mine, wide and wild, and his nostrils flared. Shock, pure shock, flashed across his features at whatever he saw on my face, and he stumbled back a step, actually stumbled. What is, I began, but he disappeared, simply disappeared, not a shadow in sight, into the crisp air. Stop, I literally can't, because then when you read, in Akamov, his perspective of that moment when he realized, just stop, just stop. I literally, I actually can't. I need to like tab everything. I just finished Akatar. It is literally 3 a.m. It's 2.50 right now in the morning. So guys, I was gonna finish this book tonight. <laughs> I literally love it. Five stars. I mean, the series is already five stars, so you should just know that, like, I'm not gonna rate the books because, like, you already know what the rating is. But I think when I first rated this book, I think I rated it like a four stars, but it's just so near and dear to me that it is a five stars. And I like now that so there's some connections when you reread Akhtar. this one doesn't have a lot of them for like i feel like knowledge that you need to know because it's weird because i feel like this one was almost like you knew it was going to be a series but it almost felt like a standalone no but she planned everything out from the start so anyway like the next books it's going to be more like oh what's this about because like this book was about like amarantha and like doing that whole entire like curse thing and fixing that but like the next one's like an akamoth and an akawar where they're the actively fighting against the king of hybern loved this took me like two months to finish but once i started it today i literally couldn't stop Ugh, three o'clock in the morning hey guys um so yeah i have decided to split this video into parts just because this video is so hard to edit Y'all, and I know that some of you really, really want this video out there. So I'm doing you guys a favor. You guys are welcome. So we're going to be splitting this up into parts by book, which honestly can even help because A Court of Silver Flames, I haven't even begun to reread yet. So I feel like it's helpful to have separate videos for all of them. I don't know. I feel like it's just more helpful than having to sit down and watch like hours and hours of footage. So hopefully you guys enjoyed and are looking forward to the next few videos with these because Akamoff and Akavor are literally already read. So you don't have to wait for me to read those. Just you have to wait for me to edit them. So 
I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you guys did, you guys know what to do. Like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube stuff that you guys know how to do. And I will see you guys then. I see ya. Peace.